let us make man this is the scripture where god was talking about creating the human and when he talked about creating the human he said let us make man and for me the us in let us make man entails and implies to me that i should be assisting god with making men and this is where the x for boys comes into play this is the new man making machine in albany georgia Welcome to The Fallen State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. A quick reminder that The Fallen State is now on Locals.com. So click the link in the description to support our work. And thank you all in advance. I do appreciate it. Very interesting guest today. I have with me Keen Randall. He is the CEO and founder of the X Program for Boys and the Life Preparatory School for Boys. Amazing. Thank you for coming on, Key. Uh, thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Glad to be here. So your real your your real name is Key? Yes, sir. King Randall. Yes, really? sir. King Randall the first. When I yes, when sir. I first saw the name, I thought uh you were like the king of England or the UK or something. <laughs> no, sir. No, nope. King Randall the first. Yes, sir. Right on. So I want to get to what you're doing there to help the guys. Um, what's important to you? Um, just in general, I definitely say making men. Um, that's our motto in our organization is let us make man. Um, I believe it's important for our boys, especially, uh, whom don't have in the home, who don't have any major male figures. And just in this day and age of 2022, where masculinity is being thrown out the window, I believe it's important for our boys to have that um, and to have a place where they can go to learn how to be a man and learn what it is to be a man um, in this day and age. They need to be surrounded by men. And in order to be a man, you got to see a man. And I think that's extremely important for our boys. And what made you decide what was happening that caused you to decide to, you know what, I'm going to do what I can to help. What brought it yep. to your attention? Yes, sir. Um, well, I'm 23 years old now and I was 19 when I began the program. Um, at that time, one of my classmates um, that I graduated with, uh, his brother committed a murder um, here in our hometown, and um, he was told to hide the weapon, um, my classmate that is, and um, he wasn't at the actual crime. And um, anyway, uh, they, they came and raided the house and found the weapon, and you know he got sentenced to 30 years in prison for hiding the weapon, even though he wasn't at the location. And at that moment, I realized that, there, that we didn't have any juvenile uh, rehabilitation programs you know, for juvenile offenders coming out of jail and i was like well how do we expect our children to to change and they don't have any rehab or any type of programs to really combat uh that recidivism rate um in our hometown so i decided to start a program with the boys i started taking them on field trips teaching them how to change oil on cars teaching them how to change brakes doing sheetrock uh whatever anything you can yeah. name you know we changed toilets painting laying bricks um, i taught boys how to do all these things for uh the course of two to three years then I discovered boys that didn't know how to read um, and they were in multiple different grades. About 20 to 30 boys couldn't read and write. Um, and I was wondering who was passing them through school. And then that's when I get, got the idea uh, to start our school life prep. Um, and, you know, we've opened now. Um, but back then it was just all an idea. Um, but that's kind of where the motivation for our school and our after school program came from. Um, uh, mostly boys, they don't have fathers around. Yeah, over ninety percent of the boys that I work with uh, are fatherless. Yes, sir. Wow. And what is what are the age range that you allow in the age range of the boys? Our after school program, our boys ages eleven to seventeen, and our school right now is only sixth graders. Oh, okay. And um, they don't have fathers around. How do you deal with their anger when they start to act out and get angry and that kind of stuff? How do you deal with that? Well, with our school, our school is boarding. Um, so we board those students. So a lot of them, um, they just need to develop habits. Um, and people don't understand that habits are, you know, an extreme part of who you are. Um, habits build character and character makes the man. 
Um, and that's something I believe wholeheartedly. So we have to instill different habits in them, like, um, you know, waking up in the morning at a certain time of day, um, making sure they're eating at a certain time, making sure they're exercising, making sure they're, you know, doing their activities or whatever. And most of them are only angry because of the environments they're in. Um, over 90% of their issues are <laughs> just their environment. If we remove them from an environment where they have to be angry and never get angry anymore, and whenever they do decide to get mad, you know, we teach them how to channel that and, you know, pr produce something you know, um, with it versus producing, you know, something negative, produce something positive uh, with that and just teach them how to keep their bearing. Um, one of our, you know, biggest slogans is keep your bearing. Um, and I think that's something for our boys to always have, even men in general. Um, most of our issues that we get into is because we won't keep our bearing. We have to, you know, uh, keep, you know, our bearing because we have to realize where we at, situational awareness, et cetera. And should I get angry right now? Should I get mad? How is this going to affect my home? How is this going to affect my family? Etc. So this is why I teach them about keeping their bearing, you know, and putting them in situations where they have to keep their bearing. So that way, when they get into life, they'll have these habits that we already built with them and having these uh, different values that we already have in them. Um, but most of them, you know, they don't really get too much angry around us because we just, you know, shower them with different things to do. Um, you know, and other men around them, they're quick. They get angry with their moms, but they're, they're not going to get angry with other men around. Um, they're willing to listen. Um, and I think that's important also and just teaching them how to respect their parents etc. So we don't really deal with too much anger issues, actually. You know, we just we just are who we are. We're men um, and our staff, you know, we, we make sure that they are taken care of and they have everything they need and they respect us. So um, that's kind of how we deal with that. Do they ever talk about their situations at home, how difficult it is with their mothers? And do they ever bring up their fathers? They like want to see their fathers or talk about not having fathers? Well, I mean, not for the most part, not really. Um, they will talk about um the issues at home that they do, yeah. do deal with. You know, I've had some of them being starved before, um, dealing with molestation or what have you. They deal with different things at home or peer pressure from the kids in the neighborhood, moms who work too much or having to be forced to be the parent. You know, a lot of them forced to be the father of the home or, or the man of the house, you know, at a young age, you know, because their parents treat them that way, especially their moms. You know, I say moms create sons, bins all the time time you know and since your husband not there you you make your son the man of the house and make him the husband yeah you know, but but not sexually you know yeah. so they have so many sons bins nowadays and these boys are having to grow up you know ahead of their, their time um but a lot of them they don't really talk too much about what's going on at home unless they are you know dealing with something at home right you know most of them kind of live like normal lives with their moms but you know i'm i'm just grateful to the parents you know whom um send their children to our program and to our school because that means that they are wanting something different for their child and they know that they can't best do it by themselves. They need a village to help do so. Do they have to, do the parents have to pay for the school or do you fundraise for that? We fundraise for it. Our boarding school and after school program is completely free. Um, we don't receive any government funding, no, no grants, anything. We just simply raise money and we're able to take care of the program that way. Um, that's how we're able to do it. Um, so we're just grateful for the people that are able to help us fundraise. Um, it gets a little tough sometimes. Sometimes we, you know, we do okay. Um, but for the most part, you know, we're able to take care of our students, get their uniforms, get their haircuts, feed them three, three meals a day, pay the light bill, pay the mortgage and make it happen, you know, for our students with people just simply give into our program. Um, we don't want to have any government funding because then we have to scratch where we don't itch and we have to dance to music we don't like. <laughs> uh, so we want to make sure that we, we take care of our program and yeah. do what we want to do um, yeah. with our boys. And um, do they have to do work around there to show the appreciation since they're getting everything free? Do they have to earn it in some kind of way on campus there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they have, we have uh, plenty of work for them to do. They cut the grass. Oh. They clean up the school. Um, our requirements are, you know, all A, so we make sure that they're, you know, getting their studies at school. Um, but they do different things, such as, uh, you know, they do firearms training, and we, you know, take them different places. And, you know, we just, we allow them to be kids also, right. um, you know, while they're here, even though we're instilling, you know, a lot of values in them, we still allow them to be boys and let them fight and all that stuff like that. They just, they're boys, is what they do, especially when they're bored and they're becoming brothers. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we deal with their little normal 11, 12-year-old issues and, you know, uh, we keep it moving. Um, but for the most part, yeah, they do have things they have to do to, you know, um, show appreciation. And their parents do a lot, you know, for the program, you know, buying water and things like that. So, oh, you nice. know, we just have a, a big collective, like, family now, I would say, um, for our school. How, how long is the program? When do they, when, how long is the program before they graduate? Um, so the the children that are in the actual school, um, they will they're starting in sixth grade this year. Next year, this group will move to seventh grade. 
once they move to seventh grade, we'll we'll take in new sixth graders. So they have to start in sixth grade with us. Oh, okay. And then that following year, they'll go to eighth grade, and we'll take those sixth graders, move them to seventh grade, and we'll take in new sixth graders all the way up until they go to high school. And that's how we'll fill up the school as the years go by. Oh. We just want to make sure that you know completely have you know our values because I could take 11th and 12th graders, 10th graders, but some of their minds are so far gone already. It's easier to get those younger children who are sponges, who are still trying to figure themselves out, who are still trying to figure out who they are. We want to make sure we're taking their brain that's like a sponge already and, and injecting it with everything they need to know about you know, being a man and, and being positive, giving back to your community, being a team leader, you know, and just, uh, just making sure they're working with each other. Um, that's big. Um, for us, um, but they have to start in um, uh, sixth grade with us. Now, the after school program is open to all boys at ages 11, 17 until they graduate high school. Oh, okay. And um, um, are you one of the teachers there? You teach? Uh, no, I actually don't teach. I'm just a chief instructor. I only teach uh, the automotive repair, uh, construction. Um, I have guys come in and teach welding. I have firearms instructors for firearms. I have martial arts teachers for martial arts. I have swimming instructors for swimming. Oh, um, nice. I have other yeah, I have teachers for teaching because that's not my strong suit. However, I do, um, you know, drill uh, language arts and, and reading and spelling with them because I am I, was, I am really good at that. Uh, so I make sure they are on, on their reading, their writing and their spelling. And that's extremely important. Literacy is important to me. So we do do our book club um, during the week, you know, with the boys, teaching them how to read, teaching them different vocabulary words, making them use these vocabulary words. You know, I was just making sure we're expanding their knowledge and things like that. But no, I, I have a full staff. I'm not even a headmaster, our headmistress. Um, you know, she's graduated from uh, University of Georgia um, and she has a master's in education from there. Um, so she's our headmistress. And, you know, we have other female staff also, as well as male staff, because they do need a balance. So we want to surround them with the type of women we think they should marry. And we, we want to surround them with the type of men that we feel like they should want to be. Um, so that's something that's important um, to us. What is a headmistress? Uh, the headmistress is like the principal of the school. So uh, oh. she's like the principal for a private school. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Why didn't you get a man to be the principal? Um, well, I, I think she's she's extremely qualified for the job that she's doing. Um, however, I'm the chief instructor. So you could say like I'm the assistant principal per se or whatever. But of course, I'm still the founder and owner. So I still call all the shots for the <laughs> most part. Um, she still, you know, does her job. I still listen to her um, because it's important. Um, she does cover a lot of bases that I may forget. She does things that I don't think about. And she has a lot of knowledge from being on that college campus for four years and working with ESPN, et cetera. She's worked with Dactronics and, um, you know, football, baseball, basketball. So she has a lot of sport knowledge, too, that transfers into how a school is ran. Um, so she's had a lot of back knowledge, you know, just being at the University of Georgia for so long and working, you know, um, in the background for a lot of different uh, activities there, a lot of different clubs there. She's done a lot. Um, at University of Georgia. So that's why she's the headmistress of the school. And um, I just want to make sure they have a balance there too. I, and the reason I ask because I've noticed that women, it's not in the nature of women to lead. They were created mm -hmm. to follow. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was growing up down in Alabama, uh, the principal was always men. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't have a vice person. We just had a principal. And it was always mm -hmm. a man and not a woman. And uh, because it was known that women didn't have the patience or it's not in them to lead. Have you noticed that? Um, I will say uh, with her, um, she's worked with children. Like she's worked with Girls Inc. She's worked with a lot of, you know, Girl Scouts. And so, so she's been working with children for forever. Um, she's about 29 years old now, uh, but she's been working with children forever. So her working with the children is easy. I, so I just kind of look for if they've already been working with children before for any females that are on staff, any women that are on staff, I make sure that they have already been working with children because I know that they don't have a lot of patience like we do. Yeah. They're kind of uh, more you know, um, short-sighted versus far-sighted. And you know, emotional. So, um, I do. They're very emotional too. Well, I, but it, yeah, that's true. But I absolutely need <laughs> that um, in the program, you know, because they do need to have somebody there to nurture them sometime. Like some of the boys, you know, I do have female staff that, you know, talk to them in the evenings. And sometimes they're able to pull things out of the boys that I'm not. You know, sometimes they'll talk to them about certain things that they're not. They won't talk to me about, you know, and they'll come back and report to me, you know, what's happened or what did he say or what they, what was going on with him? Because they're able to be a little bit more nurturing with them and talk to them. They're, they're doing their job being nurturers you know, and us being the providers and protectors, that's what we do. So it's literally like a family here. 
I'm gonna just make sure they have, you know, women around that they're able to to uh, be around and, and, and have somebody to nurture them. And we're also the disciplinarians, you know, that's where we come in and, and come with our deep voice and, and telling you what to do <laughs> and stuff like that. So I just make sure it's a balance there. And so by the time they reach sixth grade, sixth grade, how old is the sixth grade? 11 years old, 11, 11. 12. By the time they reach sixth grade, haven't they had too much mama nurturing already? That, that's what <laughs> made them weak. Well, you definitely notice a lot of it, but a lot of 11 year olds are very impressionable. Um, a lot of them have made significant changes just in the three months that we've been open because they're surrounded by men. Um, even many of the boys whom were overweight, they've lost so much weight now. If you look at some of the pictures from when they first started school versus where they are now, it's only been three months and they've lost significant amounts of weight and uh, they're standing up straight. They're using projecting their voices. Um, you know, they're giving the proper greeting of the day. You know, these are all these things that we're just instilling on them. They're just habits. We're just building habits right. with them that they're giving. And so when they're going back home and their moms are sending these messages about how much they've changed and how much they're listening now and not talking back, et cetera. And sometimes <laughs> I tell the moms, you know, being honest with them, I said, well, mama, if you look at how he's acting, he's acting just like you. He's doing what? the same mannerism that yeah. you're doing. And they're just like, wow, I didn't even notice that. I'm like, yeah, he's doing the exact same things that you're doing. Um, but I, you know, I'm grateful to them again for just even wanting different for their sons right. to be able to send them to a school like ours. That's uh, what I've found out or uh, realized is that a lot of mothers don't realize that they have recreated their sons and daughters in their image by being yep. impatient with them, making them angry, imposing on them like that. And when the right. kids act like them, they don't see that. Wow, this child is acting like me. Be uh -huh. Because if they saw it, then they could cut it out, stop doing that, and the kids would get better sooner rather than later. Right. Absolutely. That is 100 percent. Yes, sir. You have gotten a lot of attention from media and politicians and things. Are you surprised by that? Uh, no, not at all. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, it's sometimes people, you know, question our program because it does seem too too good to be true sometimes. Right. Um, but, you know, we're actually active and we're actually here and our students are walking <laughs> around right now as I speak, you know. Um, so um, it, people have, you know, looked at our program and it's not being done a whole lot of places. So, you know, at first it was uh, kind of overwhelming at first because, you know, when things go viral and it just kind of hits you all at one time. Right. Um, but no, I wasn't necessarily surprised by the attention because I knew one day somebody was going to see what we were doing because it was different and people were going to love what we we're doing. So, yeah, people have reached out, celebrities included, um, politicians or whatever, have all reached out in support of the program. Yes, are they sir. helping you financially as well? Yeah, a few of them are. A few of them are just helping by sharing it. Um, a lot of them, you know, have huge amounts of following. Right. Uh, so some of them just sharing is them helping, you know, uh, our cause, even if they don't donate financially. You know, people, everybody that shares, everybody that hits the like button, everybody that shoots a comment, even if they're able to give one dollar or 50 cents, you know, everybody's helping in their own way, um, you know, regardless of if they're able to give financially or not. You know, so I'm just appreciative of all of our, you know, supporters um, just in general. Where do you, oh, let me ask, do you accept just black boys or all races? No, all races are welcome. You will see an overwhelming amount of black boys because we live in a 77% black city. Uh -huh. um, and I only take, yeah, I only take whoever signs up. Now, our after school program, we have white children and Mexican children that have come to the after school program, but our boarding school, you only see black children because that's all who signed up for <laughs> school. So yeah. um, that's all we got. <laughs> yeah. But um, whoever signs up, we take everybody. Uh, we're not legally allowed, even if we wanted to, to take only black children. We have to take all children at our school. Right on. And what motive you? Tw how old are you? I'm 23 now. And so and how old were you when you started the program? 19? 19. Yes, sir. So where do you get your motivation from? Why are you so motivated? Have you always uh, well, been that was, way? First of all, did you grow up like that? Yeah, I was raised in a full family. Uh, I had a mom, uh, my former stepdad, and my current stepdad helped raise me along with my grandfather, my uncles, um, et cetera, and my grandmama. And, you know, my grandmother's a pastor. My mom's a pastor. My grandfather's a pastor. So we had a lot of that <laughs> uh, Christianity and, and upbringing. I played the drums my whole life in church. So I've been at church every single Sunday, you know, for my whole life up until I turned about 18 when I went to the Marine Corps. Uh, so I've had a whole lot of, you know, church experience and just being reared and raised by men, you know, who are masculine, whom, you know, are able to teach me right and wrong. So sometimes a lot of people are asking, you know, how are you so young and know this and that? Or why do you act a certain way? Well, 
back in the day, a lot of these things weren't, you know, it weren't, it wasn't a surprise because a lot of young guys back then were doing their thing. Dr. King got his doctorate degree at like 24, 25. None of this stuff was, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't new then, but now it's new because all, it's like all boys are doing something crazy or people are expecting me to be out partying and drinking and, and whatever on somebody's college campus and then trying to get my life right later. I'm like, no, I want to work now so I can play later. Let's work now and put yeah. things together for our communities now. So maybe when I turn 40 or 50, then I could sit on a yacht somewhere, eat some chicken wings and do whatever <laughs> I want. But as of right now, you know, I want to make sure that I'm working. But while I have the energy, while my back is not hurting, while my knee's not hurting, I want to make sure I have, you know, do all that work now so I can prepare for later when my back decides it doesn't want to act right and I can just sit down for a day. Uh, so, but I was definitely raised like this. Um, I credit all of my family, you know, for how I was raised. And um, you know, did you go to college? Like yes, I went to college in high school. I graduated with an associate's degree in culinary arts when I was seventeen. Oh, and so where was your father? Uh, my biological father. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, he was around ish. Uh, I mean, he wasn't always there or anything like that. But you know, he and I have a relationship. You know, I can call him whenever. Um, oh, you do. You have. You have a relationship with him? Yes. Uh -huh. we, okay. we stay in the same town. Um, I do uh, raise all of my younger brothers and sisters on his side. I'm my mom's only child. Um, I'm, I was a miracle baby. My mom's not supposed to be able to have children. Um, but my dad um, has about six or seven, and I kind of raise all of them. Um, my younger brother, he's about 17 years old. He's like the the chief guy of like what I want all the boys to be. He's about six one now. Um, but you know, so he's my, my big little brother, but you know, I take care of him and, you know, he'll credit me for how he's been raised. And I took care of him, my younger sister, my other younger brothers or whatever, I take care of them. But my father and I have a, a relationship, you know, I can call him, um, I can go see him, you know, he's been to our school, you know, he's oh, come, you know he, my birthday and stuff. So it's not like we have a bad relationship. It's just, I don't fault him for not having been raised how I was. My dad was a foster child. He was stolen from his parents and stuff, and he only grew up in foster homes. So I can't fault him for not knowing how to be a father when he was never taught or shown. Right on. You know, so that's just that's who he is. You know, I've accepted who he is. Don't get mad at him. You know, so it's just that's just him. So <laughs> nice. Um, what? Um, how do you feel about women being preachers? <laughs> uh, I don't have an issue with it because my grandmother uh, was preaching my whole life. Uh, so. <laughs> She's always been this fireball preacher and people have always loved her uh, preaching. My mom included, my grandfather included. So I don't have an issue with that at all. Um, that's just yeah. um, what I grew up, grew up seeing. My grandmother's always been, even to this day, she had this prayer line she does. And, you know, they're, you know, her and, uh, you know, she has just people come on the prayer line and she prays for them. They have Bible study and she's been doing this for years, you know. So um, even my students know, you know, my grandmother is the person they ask to go pray for them and, you know, but when I bought the school, she came to pray over the school and all that stuff. Like, that's what she does. That's Amazing. how I was raised. Oh, yeah. What made women want to be preachers? Because God don't call women to be preachers and pastors and things like that. What do you think make women want to be preachers? Because God would never wow. put a woman over men, right? God in Christ. You believe it? You're, you're a Christian, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in that order of God and Christ, Christ and man, man over woman and woman over children? Yeah, absolutely. That's like the umbrella thing. Yep. Yeah. And so what made women be preachers since God is not encouraging them to do it? How do they come up with they want to be a preacher? I, I couldn't tell you. I had to ask my grandma or something. I never you know, <laughs> asked the question. So <laughs> I probably have to ask her, ask my mom. Have you ever wondered that at all? How, how come y'all, the women, my mama, my grandmama and... Just the rose down the rose are all preachers. How did that happen? You ever question that? No, I, I never um, really questioned it because I, you know, saw so much positivity come from it, and you know, so much, you know, we done at the church, you know, grandma and granddad, you know, and my mom and stuff. So you know, I've seen so much done, miracles happen. You know, I mean, that's how I grew up. So I didn't really have a question for it unless something bad was happening, but nothing bad ever happened. You know, with our churches, it's just you know, just major moves of God. And, you know, that's that's why I'm still a Christian. So <laughs> when you were growing up, not having your father, there, it sounded like you had stepfathers. How mm -hmm. did you yes, handle your mother's imposing her will on you? You know, when she would be impatient or she would try to um, make you do things you weren't ready to do yet and stuff like that. When she tried to impose her will on you, how did you deal with that? How did you handle that? 
Well, my grandmother raised my mom pretty swell. Um, so my mom, you know, is a great mom and I never really had to deal with like her overpowering, like my stepdad and raising me and stuff like that. Like she would always go to him for what to do with me. Like the most she would say is, you know, I'm disappointed in you or something like that, or go wash the dishes and stuff like that. But as far as like, you know, major things, you know, it was always my former stepdad, you know, who would, you, you know, was doing the rearing, you know, of course my mom, you know, I'm disappointed in you. You shouldn't do that. I'm gonna tell your dad on you, you know, and stuff like that. But it was never any of that. Now my grandmother um, was a little bit, you know, like that because she was super, my grandmother's like super, super, super Bible. So like, I don't care what it was. Like, my Bible grandmother say so, Yeah. So my grandma was like, if she says it's the devil, you can't do it. If you like, she wouldn't let us watch certain movies and all that stuff, you know, so that was grandma. But my mom never um, like imposed her will or anything like that. It was always, you know, talking to me, you know, softly and, you know, speaking to me. And my grandmother and my mom did a great job of trying to show me what a wife you know, was supposed to be. Um, they they did that, you know, and my and I've watched them do that. So that's how I know, you know, how I'm supposed to choose and who I'm supposed to be with and what Are type you married of person now? I'm supposed to be. No, I was married. I was previously married, yes sir. Really? Yes, sir. You have kids? Yes, sir. I had both of my children in marriage. I had two of them, King William and King Randall the second. Really? So yes, you've sir. been married with and you have kids, you know, a little old enough to have kids or be married. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got married immediately out of high school. And what made you marry so soon? Because of how I was raised. You were raised to get married soon? Yep. Well, not necessarily soon. It's just married because that's what I wanted to do. And that's I was raised to do that. I've always wanted to be a husband and a father. Um, I've always wanted a lot of children. You know, that's that's how I was raised. You know, um, so that's that's why I got married out of high school. I was ready for it. You Did know? you so marry the wrong woman? <laughs> I wouldn't say that I married the wrong woman. I would never, you know, um, say anything about her like that. Um, we just, I guess we'll say we just weren't equally yoked. Oh. Um, and yeah, we just had to keep it moving. Um, you know, we were two different people, you know, and, but, you know, we have two beautiful children. We co-parent well, you know, and, and that's how that went. So, yes, sir. Amazing. So do you think you will ever get married again? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I why? definitely want to be married again because I cannot operate at my full capacity without a woman. Oh, really? Um, that's amazing. So you cannot, what does that mean? I can't operate in my fullest capacity without a woman. Because she is going to bring out everything in me that I even, didn't even know was there. Like all the hell? <laughs> that too. She's going to make sure, she's going to make sure I'm angry when I need to be. She's going to make sure <laughs> that's I'm for sure. in the background yeah. that I don't have it. Like, you know, like, for example, like people I may be talking to or dealing with, Wives are, you know, in the background, kind of paying attention and come back home, baby. I don't think that person is good for you to be talking to. Or we're looking at back end things or, oh, whatever, just giving me the energy I need or, or giving me the motivation I may need when I feel like giving up or whatever. Or even just helping with certain things that I may not see that needs to be done, you know, with my business dealings or whatever. They're always there for that, even with child rearing, et cetera. They're there to help with all of that. I can't have children and operate as a father without a mom. You know, so I think all of that, you know, is is it's is a balance there. That's why, you know, God made both of us to complement each other. And he didn't make Adam by himself. You know, he made Adam and he made Eve for them to complement each other. So I definitely don't think I'm able to operate at full capacity unless I have her there in my corner to back me up. Amazing. So uh, do you have anger? Oh, of course. All, everybody got anger. <laughs> um, do you believe we human beings should be angry or should we um, overcome it? I think there's a time and a place for anger. I mean, Jesus got angry before. Um, I think there's a time and place, you know, to be angry. But what do you do with that anger is what's important. Um, Because usually anger brings about negativity. But if I get angry enough for something positive, I'll go and make it happen. Just as I got angry with our local school system for how they were doing our students, I decided to do something else. I channeled that anger into positivity. I, I turned it into something that I could do well for our students. And I did it because I was angry and riled up about the situation not to go and do anything negative but do anything positive but do something positive so overcome the negativity of anger and bring out the positivity in it because there is you know there can be some positivity in that fire that comes in you when you're angry it's just what you decide to do with it why do you think jesus had anger uh he got angry um i for, i can't even remember when he got angry um <laughs> <laughs> but i can't i say he got angry i think either um it wasn't when the devil was tempting him, if I'm not mistaken. It wasn't then. 
Um, oh, he got angry when he was at the the temple. Um, when those people came and he was throwing the tables around and all that stuff, because uh, you know, he had left and he came back and he was angry uh, with the people in there. Um, uh, I think. Um, yeah, I think that was the time he got angry. But it's a right. It was a righteous anger. Like he he didn't. That wasn't a sin for him to be angry. He was just angry. But he had a right to be. Um, but again, it's all in what you do with your anger. So, uh, since we all know that anger is of the devil and mm -hmm. love, real love is of God, right? Yes. Can you serve the devil and God? Because if no, you, you have, when you have anger, if you have anger, you're serving the devil. And when you, mm -hmm. and that's why God said that we must be born again of the heart, mm -hmm. salvation is of the heart. And what he does is he take away the anger by, uh, once you realize you're wrong for being angry, because mm -hmm. anger is hatred, hatred is judging. And when you judge, mm -hmm. you're playing God, right? And mm -hmm. before you enter into the kingdom of heaven, he will take the spirit of the anger away from you because that is the nature of the devil. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I think, well, it, looking at er everybody's different, I guess, looks of anger. I I'll guess I'll say like, because I'm not a person to get mad or angry. Most people know me. I'm just always happy no matter what happens. Right. Um, I'm always, you know, chilling and happy or whatever about whatever happens. But I think I'll say when you get majorly frustrated, with something, um, because I think frustration and anger is different too. Because, and I and I can agree with that uh, that assessment of anger because I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like when I when there's anger present, there is hatred. Like yeah. you you want to kill somebody when you're angry. So I can understand that. So I'll change my way of saying it into saying frustrated, um, not not angry because I get frustrated often. You know, I get frustrated and and I just like, oh, like how can I fix this or do something different? So. I'll definitely say frustrated because absolutely when you are angry, you are willing to do stuff you don't have no business. Yeah. You probably will. Avoid Jesus angry. had discernment. He was of love. He came that he might free us from the darkness of anger, which is hatred. Mm -hmm. And so he, when he turned the table over at the temple there, he had discernment because with discernment, you can see injustice and deal with it, right? But if mm -hmm. you get angry at it, it controls you. And, right. and people who have anger, they, are, they feel good and they feel bad. They feel good and up and down emotionally. And they are right. controlled by that. You know, if right. someone knows that you have anger, they can make you feel good and, or they can make you feel bad. And that's right. how they, they control you. But if you don't have anger, you cannot be controlled. Right. Have you noticed Absolutely. that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can't control anybody because uh, one of my students, um, you know, he he has an issue. I tell him he gets in his feelings too often yeah. because the boys in the program, like, you know, of course, they're boys. You know, they pick at each other sometimes like that. But everybody can take a joke except for him. You know, so every time, you know, he tries to pick on people, they go for the juggler with him because they know he's going to get angry. Right. immediately. Yeah. He can never just let it go. Or even if we're playing football or something and everybody start talking trash, you know, whatever. But. He takes it to the heart and wants to start, you know, you know, penalizing and, and start, you know, punching people and pushing too hard and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, why are you getting angry? I'm like, you're on the winning team and you're still mad at what they're saying. <laughs> you're winning. So what you mad about? You know, but that's something that we have to teach them to channel, you know, teach them. You know, that's why they're here. Um, but, yeah, definitely getting angry can play you out your position. You can definitely lose a lot that you have going on. You can lose your family. You can lose everything, you know, off of anger right. five minutes. You know, if, so he to, we like to if he were to if he were to forgive his mother, realizing she couldn't help himself herself, mm -hmm. then God would take that anger away from him and replace his change his heart from anger to love. Then he would mm -hmm. be able to deal with issues of life without overreacting right. to them. But he got to forgive mm -hmm. her for what she's done. Understood. You are uh, you remind me of Booker T. Washington. That's one of my favorite people. We've been studying his book up from slavery in our book club. Yeah, I use that book too. Uh, and mm -hmm. I grew up near Tuskegee, so we used to go there every summer for about a week mm -hmm. or two. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and about a week, I think. But it was, he was teaching men how to be uh, productive, teaching them trades, you know, how to build things so that when they did go out on their own, they would know how to work. And they will have a trade if they decided they didn't want to go to college and that kind of stuff. And you remind mm -hmm. me a lot of that. So I think I know what you're doing is a very, very good thing by teaching these boys how to work with their hands 
and teach right. them a trade like that because they will always have food on their table as long as they mm-hmm. know how to work. They can start their own businesses. So many things they can do with a trade. Right. Absolutely. You can do so much with the trade. Um, people don't teach about trades enough um, right. or even teach their children to go to technical school, you know, before going to a four year university. I think, you know, before a child goes to a four year university, I don't believe that, you know, children at 18, 17, 18 years old need to be going to a university or leaving home just yet. Yeah. I think they all need to go to a local technical college for two years before they go off to a four year university. The reason I say that is because for one, they're too young. Um, they're 18, 19. They're going to go change their major two or three times while they're there. You know, a lot of stuff, you know, that happens at college, they're not mature enough to deal with, you know, so I think a lot of that is important, you know, for us to pay attention to. Yeah. And just going to technical school for a two year degree, you know, in, in whatever trade or even just business management or accounting, all of that is important. Um, and then they go to a four year university after they leave that two year technical college, you know, just turn in 19 or 20, get you a little bit more mature you know, and just not being a fresh out of high school child, because you're still mentally in high school, even after you graduate. So we have to get them into adult life, give them a few responsibilities, you know, instead of just sending them straight off to go to college to do who knows what, yeah. and just hope they do something good. You know, I, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm not a fan of that. So I'm, I believe right it's important to, to do things the correct way. Do you have boys or girls your own? My two boys. Right on. Real men make boys first. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. Uh, let me ask, have you ever been compared to Booker T. Washington before? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I have a picture of him at the school, actually, on the wall. And have people told you that, that you remind them of him? Yes, sir. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's amazing, man. I um. I, I, so I, are you a conservative? Uh, I guess you could say more, mostly conservative, yes, sir. Because <laughs> I'm super... Super traditional, you know, yeah. um, I try not to do the, the labels and stuff, you know, but right. I'm super traditional. I do everything, you know, straight like granddaddy taught you how to do. And obviously your granddaddy was conservative. But of course, you know, in this new day and age, they're going to tell you something in the opposite. But I'm just all about our core values, our family values, putting God first and making sure our country, you know, is is up to par and what we need it to be. Did I read or see somewhere that you met Donald Trump, the great white hope? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you met Donald Trump? Uh, not like personally, but I've been extremely close to him, took pictures. My students have been to the White House. Um, so, yes, sir. But not like directly just shaking hands. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's your impression of him? I don't have any issue with him at all. Um, I, he was probably the most real president that we had. He's going to yeah, say what's yeah. on his mind. And you didn't have to worry about if he was politicking or anything. He's just going to say what was on the dome. Right. I thought on. that was it. Because every other politician, you got to try to figure out what they're trying to say and sift through their words. And Trump was just like, bro, look, this is what it is. This is how you're going to get it. And this is how you're going to receive it. And, and that was it. <laughs> and, right. and, he had, and he had everybody's political eyeballs open. Everybody's political shades were off. Because now you're paying attention to what's going on versus now that you have a politician back in there and you just – going with the flow and don't care who's in the presidency and they're just saying nice stuff all day and they're not saying mean things on Twitter and blah, blah, blah. You know, so it's like your political shades are back on, you're going back to sleep because there's a regular politician in there now. But versus when Trump was in there, everybody was paying attention to what was going on. I think that type of stuff is important for us. He remind me of the old school when men were that way. You know, they didn't bite their tongue about things and they they work hard and they uh, encourage their children to work and and right. they speak their mind. Donald Trump remind me of that a lot. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Amazing. Are you ever attacked for supporting President Trump? Uh, yeah, we definitely got attacked for visiting the White House in my hometown. You know, it was about <laughs> two years ago, and um, people were upset that I took the boys to the White House, and I was just like, why would I turn down this free? The opportunity for our students to be on their first flight, yeah. their first you know time being in a nice hotel, going to D.C., going to the White House. I'm like, why would I turn down that experience because y'all don't like who the president is? I'm like, that don't make no sense. I think that's dumb. If I were to take them right now and Joe Biden's in there, y'all would be all for it and it'd be all over the news. Yeah. You know, but, you know, I'm just like, you have to stop being, you know, hypocritical. And I'm just like, these students deserve that opportunity. They've been working hard, you know, so I don't care who's in the White House. We're going to take them to, to visit. And, you know, but yeah, we've had, you know, spats with people online because, you know, conservative people have invited us to different outlets and different events or whatever like that. But I told them, you know, we're all about dual, um, dual opportunity 
uh, with our uh, communities. And I'm just like, whoever decides to invite us somewhere, that's cool. I teach my students to look at both sides of the political aisle. If there's a Democratic office that you could get something for your community from, go make sure you go talk to that Democratic operative. <laughs> you got something in the, um, you know, of a conservatives in office and you want to get something from the Republicans, you go talk to that operative. You go get something from them. But you're on, you want to make sure you have somebody in there that's best serving your community. I don't yeah, care what yeah. side of political aisle they're on. It's, it's about what they're doing for your community, not not who if they got a donkey or an elephant um, beside their name. <laughs> That's true, man. You are. Do you believe our battle is a spiritual battle or a physical battle? Do you believe in uh, racism? Yeah, yeah. It's all it's all spiritual. Yeah. Um, I, I, that's what I think is important. Yeah, sure, racism exists, but it, it doesn't exist on the front where we where we believe it to be today, um, where everybody has their racism shades on all day and everything that every white person does is racist and blah, 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 where we don't think that we're capable of being racist to our white people or any other race. I'm um, like, all these things, you know, we have to take take into account, but that's not our biggest issue. And I don't think that's even top 15 of our issues. Our cultures are right. our issues right now that we need to change, especially in our community um, and what our boys are listening to, what they're being surrounded by. All these cultures need to change. Um, that's what needs to change because nobody white is making us go out here and kill people. Nobody at white is out here making us, you know, do this crazy stuff or, you know, get our communities into turmoil. Nobody white is doing that. But of course, they'll tell you that that's a microcosm of white supremacy <laughs> and because we were in slavery and it translated into poverty and the poverty turned us into criminals and blah, blah, blah. I grew up in those same neighborhoods and I didn't go do that stuff. You know, so yeah. again, it's, it's important. Nobody's tried to stop us from opening our school, but black people, you know, so again, you know, it's, it's, these, these are things we deal with. Um, but that's not in one of our top 15 of issues that I believe right now. It's interesting. Uh, while growing up in Alabama and I grew up during the, uh, Jim Crow, so-called Jim Crow era down in Alabama there on a plantation. And mm -hmm. I never heard the word racism before. It was always, it was a battle between good and evil and there are evil people and there are good people. There's those who have been born of God and they're good people, right? And there are evil mm -hmm. people. So it doesn't matter about the color, that it was a spiritual battle. But when I moved out here to L.A., I started hearing the so-called civil rights leaders saying, oh, it's racism. It's racism mm -hmm. that and racism that, right? And I, I fell for that lie. But when I woke up, when God caused me to see, I realized it was a spiritual battle. And it had nothing to do with color at all. It was either right. right or wrong, good or evil. Right. Amazing, man. I want to ask, because of time here, um, I did this movie called Uncle Tom. I participated in a movie called Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom mm -hmm. 1 and Uncle Tom 2 now, right? And I really mm -hmm. want to invite you to watch Uncle Tom 2 at least. Have you seen it yet? Uh, I haven't watched it yet. They did some film. They came in on um, the, the director came and filmed me um, for like two days for it. Um, but I don't think I, I, I got in there, but he did come to uh, Albany and, and, and tape. Um, really? I wasn't in the, yeah. I so said he came for two days and um, said he wanted me to be in it about, about a year ago, I believe so. But, um, but yeah, I don't think I uh, got in there, but yeah, I hadn't watched it yet. I watched the first one. I highly I recommend it. you watch Uncle Tom too. It's going to sure. blow your mm -hmm. mind. And they're thinking of doing three, so you may end up in, it's not, they're still making one, two, and three, so you may still nah, end up, and you should okay. be in it, man. You're such an inspiration. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. You, you definitely should be in it. So watch Uncle Tom, too, and you're going to see how the whole civil rights movement was about socialism. It was about controlling the blacks so that they could mm -hmm. become, the civil rights leaders could become the head of the people. It was mm -hmm. never about making things better. And the blacks were so deceived because they thought it was about improving their lives. But if you notice the blacks, and not all, not all, not all, but most, they got worse since the civil rights movement. They're not independent thinkers as they yeah, were Malcolm prior to Malcolm X, that. Malcolm X tried to tell people that back um, when he was still alive, he was telling them that they were trying to control them. He was saying like, they're not trying to actually change things. They are just trying to get money and and look good for TV and stuff like that. Malcolm was telling them that because Malcolm wasn't about, like, sure, he talked about, you know, the, the violence that white people were inflicting on, you know, black people, but his main thing was teaching black people to do for self. He was yeah. like, we should open our own factories and our own stores, you know, and stuff like that, instead of trying to beg the white man to get in his store, why we can't open our own? He, yeah. I, I remember in the debate, 
with Bayard Rustin, he said uh, um, the black man at that time had $20 billion of, of, of spending power. Today we have a trillion dollars of spending power. He said, we are not in a more position to point the fingers today at the white man, not using any of that money to open up our own factories and our own stores and our own you know, industries. And we want to ask, get mad at the white man for not giving us jobs and factories we hadn't set up. You know, Malcolm said this and they didn't want to listen to him at the time, but that's what I've been saying for the past forever. And that's why, you know, people in my hometown don't like me and stuff, because I'm like, no, we should open up our own stuff. <laughs> yeah. And stop begging, you know, for other people to treat us fairly or whatever like that. OK, if you have an issue with the school system, open your own. If you have an issue with the hospitals, open your own. If you have an issue with prosecutors, raise your own. You have a, pe- a problem with police officers, raise your own. Literally, we could do this on your own. If you have issues with all these people and all these industries and the mailman and, and the doctor and the lawyers, go raise your own. That is what we're doing. We're raising our next doctors, right on, man. Raising our next lawyers. We're raising our next prosecutors. We're raising everybody that we want to see in our community. So that way we know that our communities are being served correctly because we raised the children and raised the men that are in them. Malcolm X even had a change of heart about white people once he went to Mecca because mm-hmm. he had believed, according to the writings, he had believed the Muslim that white people were bad while he was in prison and when he got out and joined them. But once he went mm-hmm. to Mecca, he saw all races of people together and he realized that he had been deceived even about the white people, that there were good mm-hmm. and bad people in all races. So he was a major influence because he overcame that and somebody took him out. Um, I wanted yeah. to ask, um, will you ever run for politician? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> I don't plan or ever plan to do politics at all. Um, I want to stick, you know, with working with children. This is where I best believe I could serve. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's best. Uh, it, it's, it gets ugly out there in that political space, you know, regardless of how nice of a person you are, how great you are. You know, I just think it's it's a little bit too much, but I do believe I can affect change, you know, with raising our next politicians and raising our next people to go run, you know, in these different offices um, and, and making sure we're supporting each other and for our communities. And of course, you know, making sure I have the ears of different politicians and things like that to help us continue doing our work. Right. I, um, I don't know what God's plan is, but I think you'll be a, a, a you'll be a, like a Donald Trump as a politician. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely won't, don't have any reason to hold my tongue. So that's right. Georgia, when I was growing up, Georgia was an amazing place. I thought I was going to live in Atlanta, Georgia, because I used to visit when I was younger. And now probably Georgia, not today. I'm sorry. I said probably don't want to move to Atlanta today. <laughs> no, it's a mess. What's your yes. impression of Georgia? Uh, I love South Georgia. Um, I mean, Georgia, actually, Georgia is a nice place in general. Just just got those special big cities like Atlanta and they, all the stuff that they're doing up there. But other than that, rural Georgia, South Georgia, peanut watermelon Georgia. That's that's us, man. <laughs> I'm I'm super country, killing possums and killing squirrels and and deer and all that good old stuff. And, you know, just living out in the country and, uh, you know, sitting on your back porch, eating some sugar cane. That's, that's the type of Georgia I love. <laughs> I love that. You know, man. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's our Georgia. Other than that, you know, like Atlanta and stuff, you know, that's, that's up in the city, but for us in the rural areas and the country areas, that's how we live. You know, Have we you, enjoy you, it. You've always been in the country all your life. Yes, sir. Can you ever imagine leaving there? No, I love, you know, being out here in the country, you know, and my favorite thing, you know, one day I want to get me a big house out in the country, you know, with a lot of acres of land and just stay far out away from the city. You know, I want to have to get gas to go into the city every time. Like, I want to stay really far out, have some cattle, you know, and just live peacefully out and eat some sugar cane on the back porch. That's what I want to do. (laughs) When I saw you, one of your videos where you first got some land down there to build your your school and then Mm -hmm. you got land to I think your grandmother or somebody gave you a home or somebody. And I saw you walking through the woods and showing the land. It was, it looked like freedom. It, it looked like, it looked like total freedom. And I thought how fortunate you are that you're in that environment instead of in these cities where it's just messed up, man. Yes, sir. Yeah. One thing I don't like about the city is that, you know, out there in LA and at New York, everywhere I travel, Nobody has any yard. Like, people, <laughs> how do you live and don't have a yard? Like, you don't even have a front yard, a backyard. Yeah. You know, I'm used to my, my house got like th- three, four acres of land around it. Like, that's just normal houses in Albany. Everybody has at least an acre, you know. <laughs> but 
down and then see, I'm talking about people who can mow their grass and like, fight, like with one push, then your, your grass is mowed. <laughs> like I'm used to having to be outside all day and, and raking and cutting the shrubs and, and doing all that goodness before I even go in that, like you have to dedicate a weekend to doing the yard. You're yeah. supposed to go outside on a Monday <laughs> before they leave work and go cut the grass uh. and be, be the road. <laughs> you know, that's insane. I always thought that it was insane to not have any land or these houses so close together. I'm like, man, we might as well be in apartments. Like, I can't <laughs> even scream out, you know, so <laughs> that's that's that's, you know, the city life. I can't deal with that. No, Do, sir. Have you ever had to pull to want to live in a city or considered at all while growing up? No, 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 no. <laughs> never, never, never. So <laughs> you, enjoy you were born a country boy. You're going to die a country boy. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, you know, through and through. I know how to give a good interview sometime. I know how to, you know, put on a suit and go do what I need to do. But whenever yeah. I need to get back to talking like this with my uncles, I absolutely <laughs> will and go wrestle some cattle. So, <laughs> yeah. So there are, there is a city in Georgia called Wallamana and Peanut, Georgia. Oh, no, no, no. What oh. I'm saying is uh, South Georgia is known for peanuts and oh. watermelons. So I was saying like, Peanut Georgia, like people know South Georgia for peanuts. And, oh, and I got you. Milling. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's amazing. So listen, I got to heat up this interview and throw you on the hot seat. Sure. What's up? What's I need up? you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Sure. The hot seat. Uh, do we need more white babies? Uh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, should you ever tell a woman your? Should a man ever tell a woman his problems? Uh no. Did you take? Did you take the jab? No. Is the earth flat or round? Round. Um. Amazing. Do you ever tell the people how the cow ate the cabbage? No. <laughs> <laughs> True or false, more black babies are aborted in New York than are born. True. Isn't that amazing? No, it's, it's insane. Is abortion worse than slavery? I would say yes, to a point. Did Big Mama Michelle Obama eat all the ribs? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Does a chicken have lips? No. What is a man? Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, I definitely I said a man is one who follows God. And what is love? Love is God. Did you have fun? I did. Yes, sir. Thank you, man, for taking the hot seat on and thanks for coming on. Tell the folks how to get your website and how to help, you know, help you out there. Sure. Yep. You can follow us on social media at New Emerging King. Um, you can go to our website at thexforboys.org. That's T H E X F O R B O Y S dot org to go see all of our pictures in our gallery to see what we do with the children. You can go there to uh, see how to donate. You can go there to see how to reach out to me. And we have multiple ways to donate. It doesn't have to always be monetary. We also have people who can give for, to our Amazon wish list. Uh, who uh, we have a Walmart wish list and any other ways you'd like to donate or volunteer service. You can go to our website and we also have merch there too. Um, you know, with all of our different merchandise for our school. But our website is thexforboys.org. It's T-H-E-X-F-O-R-B-O-Y-S.org. Right on, man. I hope people will help you, too. And I'm going, to send, you, I'm going to send you a little donation as well. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Can I help all of it? Um, um, is, it is it tax deductible? Just so yes, the folks sir, will know. I'm sorry? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. We're 501c3. Right on. All right. I really, really enjoy talking to you, man. You're an inspiration. And, Thank you. Uh, I, I wish you well. I hope you stay with it and just let God guide you all the way through this, man. And I, I really, it. really, really appreciate your courage to speak up. We don't see a lot of that anymore, and especially yes, young people like you. So stay with it. Yes, sir. I appreciate you so much. Yes, sir. Uh, absolutely. And thank you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Remember, the Fall Estate is now on Locals.com. So click the link in the video description to support our work. Like, follow, share, ring the bell. Uh, 
Check out the merch. We have amazing merch there, so make sure you check it out and let me hear from you. Thank you again for tuning in, folks. I appreciate it.